It is an exciting day here on the channel because we're going to be once again exploring the new potential that we have in Kerbal Space Program now that robotic parts are part of the stock game. And I thought, you know, one of the things I've always wanted to kind of do with robotic parts in this game is some kind of unfolding station. I've actually done quite a few single launch space stations on my channel that involve launching this big clump of pieces into the, into space and then they all break apart and then sort of guide themselves as separate ships with monopropellant thrusters and steer themselves around and reorient themselves. It's kind of a clunky way of doing things in the stock game without using things like, you know, mods that would let you do that using hinges. But I always thought it was kind of a, a nice, charming way of doing things. But we no longer have to work with such limitations because, of course, we can now build hinges, rotors, pistons, all that good stuff in the stock game, provided you have the new DLC, of course. So I thought, you know, what better time than to try and redo one of the things I do a lot on this channel, but actually do it in a somewhat realistic way. I know there are going to be a few cracks here and there in terms of the realism of this project, but I think it's a, d a darn side more realistic than it has been in the past. So there's a few different components here. We have those two peripheral laboratory and habitation modules that are you know, remain flush to the body of the station for the launch process and then they unfold out into a better orientation once the craft is in space and then we have the two solar arms which first of all like the uh, other modules uh, remain kind of parallel to the body of the space station and then they will unfold and then extend in length to get the solar panels nice and far away from the space station so that they're clear of any potential future expansions or indeed ships planning to dock with this thing because you know that does kind of segue on nicely to the second part of this video so uh, this video is in two parts. The first part is going to be the construction, launch, and, you know, final assembly of the space station. And then we're going to launch an SSTO with the crew to go and meet it and rendezvous. And it, it's going to be a, a grand old time. So I think the time lapse here is playing a little bit slower than perhaps my time lapses normally are because I wanted to give you, like, kind of the best perspective of how things get built. I remember uploading a space station construction time lapse video just on its own as its own thing, and people responded really well to that. So I figured people enjoy watching space stations get built. Now, in terms of this thing, a lot of uh, form is placed before the function, as you can, as you know, probably with with Kerbal Space Program. You only really need one laboratory uh, unit and a command pod, I guess, not even that, and a few solar panels, and that's really it. Space stations are still a fairly pointless endeavor, aside from the fact that they look pretty cool, and that's good enough for me. And it's not even that hard to build them if we're just doing it in one launch, so kind of got that going for it as well. So you may notice a few bits uh, appearing and then disappearing here and there at the edges of the screen uh, that never actually work their way into the final build. That's just because I, I, I tried out a lot of things with the, with the rotes and stuff, a lot of it didn't work out. Out. So if you see some bits, like suddenly see bits of the space station appearing and then disappearing without actually being shown, being constructed, if that makes sense, that's why they didn't work out well, so I got rid of them. Now I've got those four kind of cone-shaped structures with loads of struts attached to them there. This thing is very, very wobbly when not uh, strutted together, if that makes sense. The hinges themselves don't have much holding power when, you know, under a lot of G-force. So when launching this thing as a cargo, as the payload of a rocket, for example, it's going to be wobbling all over the place. It's not going to be very safe. So the thing you would do is put struts everywhere to keep it stable. But when struts are attached, the, uh, the pistons can't actually uh, counterbalance the struts. It's not like detaching payload where the struts just disappear when you stage. When you fire the pistons or hinges, the struts remain at the same length, so the pistons and hinges won't work if they're all strutted together. So my solution was to have a separate stage that just served as a structure for like holding the whole thing together during the ascent. And then once we're in space, we could attach those four conic structures and therefore get rid of the struts because, you know, because they're attached as a separate stage, as soon as they're detached, the struts will disappear and the modules will be free to unhinge, unfold and extend. So that's the purpose of that. You may notice as well that there's some probe cores and batteries and a solar panel as well as lots of solid rocket boosters on those small pieces just because obviously we'll be detaching them once we're in our final orbit and we want to be able to deal with them you know so they're not leaving clutter in space so that's why those engines and command modules are there so we can deal with them and keep our low carbon orbit nice and free of any space junk so that's the main construction of the space station pretty much are done we're going to use uh, one of the part or some of the parts from the previous dlc the making history dlc because as you can see we have an incredibly wide and obscure payload so it's a good excuse to break out the massive saturn 5 parts that came with the making history expansion 
uh, pretty much the best reason for me <laughs> to get that DLC was the big Saturn V parts. So there they are being used there. Not much more to really say about the construction of this bit, really. So I guess, without further ado, we can skip ahead to the actual launch itself. And here we are on the pad, getting ready to get clear of the ground and make our way into space. I'm using the mod uh, camera tools to get this nice cinematic pan up. A lot of people, one of the things I get asked a lot is how I get camera tools. You can get camera tools too, guys. I don't have like some secret code from some secret forum on a secret website. It's literally just the KSP forum. Uh, ca camera tools itself, I don't think is being continued by the current, like the original developer, but it's now part of BD Armory. So just download BD Armory. And for me, I just installed the camera tools module of BD Armory. You don't need to install any of the rest. So that's how you get camera tools. Please stop asking me how I get camera tools in my video. Anyway, here we are. I guess there's not much to discuss about the ascent. It's pretty much the same as all my ascents, just gradually tipping over until you get to 45 degrees. By the time you reach 10 kilometers above the uh, surface of Kerbin, I was about to say the Earth's surface, uh, surface of Kerbin. It's funny I said that actually, because I was, I, I, obviously I just said that I was thinking about saying the, the Earth's surface rather than the surface of Kerbin. Usually when talking about real life space stuff, I'm always wanting to say Kerbin instead of Earth these days. Like when I'm talking about low Earth orbit, I want to abbreviate that as LKO rather than LEO because I'm so used to saying LKO, whereas uh, LEO doesn't really come up in day-to-day -day conversation for me at least because I don't really converse with many space enthusiasts. And even though I do, um, you know, LEO isn't really something that would come up in conversation unless you're actually piloting the rocket. And since I pilot a lot of rockets in this video game, uh, LKO is <laughs> rolls far more off the tongue, far more nicely off the tongue for me, so uh, I often slip up and say uh, the Kerbin things rather than, you know, the real life things. Like, I still have to do a double take when I'm thinking about Earth's natural satellites. <laughs> Shouldn't even say satellites, should I? Earth's natural satellite being the moon. I'm like, oh yes, but we've got Minmus as well. And then I think, nope, that's a Kerbal thing. We only have one moon here in the real world. Ugh, sucks, doesn't it? The graphics are terrible here. Everything's bad. So, <laughs> here we are getting into, uh, well, not getting into orbit, but we're raising our periapsis. I, apoapsis, I should say, although we have been burning so long like this that our periapsis has emerged, although it is still well within the atmosphere, so we will need to do a secondary burn at apoapsis to get circularized. I went for a nice and high orbit. I think it's about 320,000 uh, meters. Uh, there's no reason for this other than the fact I was thinking I was aiming for 300,000 meters and overshot it slightly. So I thought let's just let's just keep let's just stick with uh, 300,000 meters and we'll go from there. So now we can do some light. I still can't get the ambient lighting quite as bright as it was. I don't know if it actually changed in version in like the versions. Like if 1.7 the ambient light boost doesn't work quite as well, or if I just haven't figured out the settings, or if it wasn't one of my mods. In fact, I think Planet Shine has an ambient boost feature, and I don't think I've set up Planet Shine properly on this save just yet so maybe that's why either way we're trying to do as many things as i can on the daylight side of kerbin just so that you can see exactly what's going on nice and easily so the first thing we're going to do now that we're in our desired orbit, we're going to detach the uh the lower stage just there because like i was saying earlier we've got those conic structures that hold the whole thing together with struts we need to deal with those but we can also deal with this as well and i thought you know we've got lots of fuel in here let's try and recover it just like last episode uh, I don't have the pistons on this this time. I thought, let's see if we land, if we aim for the sea, we can just splash down and we don't need landing legs and we can save the engine that way. However, uh, it ended up being night time by the time I, I landed and I tried guessing when to burn and as you can see, I, I got it I got it a bit wrong. So I, I probably could have just cut away and said that I landed it and everyone would have believed me, probably. So maybe I shouldn't have done that. Either way. Uh, these things are definitely going to crash into the ocean and be destroyed because I haven't put any means of them being recovered because they're very cheap. You know, solid rocket boosters, the most simple probe cores and batteries one can get. You know, it, it's not a great loss. It's not a great loss to our budget uh, by having these things be expendable. There's only so much we really need to do before it becomes a little bit overkill, guys. So here we are deorbiting the last one and we can get ready for the moment a lot of you have probably been waiting for. And that is the unfolding of the space station itself get ready you're gonna get to see it happen right after this message
for the final step. you can listen to. <laughs> Don't you wish that there was an easier way to listen to your books? I used to wish that too, until I was introduced to the company that actually really sponsored this video, Audible. For those that don't know, Audible is an application that lets you listen to a gargantuan library of fully narrated books, original audio shows, news and comedy on your device today. Go to www.audible.com slash MattLown or text MattLown, all one word, to 500, 500 and start listening with an exclusive 30-day free trial, one free audiobook of your choice and two Audible originals from an ever-changing list today. Audiobooks are great while exercising, cooking, or sobbing in the shower, and it's becoming one of my go-tos when facing long car trips as well. I'm currently reliving some of my favourite literary adventures in audio form. One of the ones I've recently finished is something a lot of you may have heard of, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's a pretty well-known book by this point, but it's space-themed and it's British, so it goes well with my channel, and the Audible version is narrated by Stephen Fry, so I would basically be doing a criminal injustice by not recommending this one. Explore all of the ways that listening to Audible can help improve mind, body and soul with your free and exclusive 30-day trial by visiting www.audible.com slash MattLown or by texting MattLown to 500 500. Subtle and barely noticeable sponsorship plugs aside, it is time to unfold the station. So I'm actually playing the footage back at about double the speed it was. So you can really get a sense of how slowly this thing unfolds. If you have the traverse rate of your hinges a little bit too high, it tends to wobble a bit too much and becomes very, very unstable. You can see it did tremor a little bit as it finished unfolding, but for the most part, it was pretty rock solid. So yeah, I set the traverse rate to pretty much the lowest unit that you can set it as. I think it's like I feel like it was set at like three or something. I can't remember what the units are for the... Uh, it's great, isn't it? Great, great for a Kerbal Space Program informative video that I don't even remember what the actual units they use are. But hopefully when you're in the space plane hangar or the vehicle assembly building and you see that slide, you can adjust. I think I set it to about three. I'll, pu I'll, put, a, I'll put a craft file in the description anyway so you can uh, have a go with yourself. And speaking of craft files, obviously it's all well and good having that space station unfolded, but it's not a great thing to have no crew aboard. We need to get... Uh, some crew uh, aboard. <laughs> so I thought it would be kind of cool to do an SSTO because I haven't done an SSTO for, you know, at least two days now. So I should probably do another one. And this one I, 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 I call all my LKO SSTOs the Vulture series just because that's the class of SSTOs I use for LKO flights. Like Vulture class SSTOs can't really go any further than low curb in orbit. And they usually always have just rapier engines or a jet engine. But I thought this time we'd go with rapiers, but also a nuclear engine engine because we got to much higher orbits than typical space stations are constructed at. So I thought it'd be useful having the extra delta V uh, that's facilitated by a nuclear engine. And honestly, nuclear engine and rapier setups are very, very efficient and they're pretty good for all kinds of SSTOs, really. So that's the uh, the methodology behind the build of this thing here. Everything else is fairly standard game, to be honest. I've got a couple of RTGs clipped into the... Uh, cargo bay i know it's not a cargo bay but it's like a docking port and it's so big and there's lots of empty space inside it that i thought it was kind of acceptable to uh click up clip our rtgs inside and it wouldn't be seen as a quote unquote cheating so our space station is pretty much directly above us to be honest so we're going to be doing a very very fast ascent because i, I could come up with some excuse as to why i uh, some story reason as to why i thought it'd be essential to get into space as fast as possible such as I don't know, one of the Kerbals on board having a bowler like I did last time. You know, there's no one on board, so that wouldn't even stand. Uh, but the truth be told, I just massively over-engineered this thing, and it turns out it has a little bit more thrust-to-weight ratio than I thought it might, so we can get into orbit very, 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 very fast. And for the whole of this flight, you'll see no temperature gauges appearing, I think. And that's because it's not because I've got uh, 
re-entry heating disabled or turned down or whatever. And it's just because I disabled the temperature gauges because I wanted to get nice and some cool cinematic shots of the SSTO. And I thought having the temp temperature gauges there jeopardized that vision somewhat. So don't worry, rest assured, this thing does work at normal re-entry heating. But that's why you're not seeing any temperature gauges appear, even though these things do get pretty toasty at the speeds we're going. So I'm going to fire the nuclear engine between about 180 and uh, 20,000 meters above the surface and then we're just going to coast our way to orbit. I'm basically holding a fairly aggressive angle, at uh, angle of attack for an SSTO flight, just waiting for my uh, rapiers to run out of uh, air. And there they are, they are now using oxidizer in their closed cycle mode. So. Where it's going to be very, very easy getting into orbit. I wasn't really thinking too much about the flight. In fact, this is actually one of the best flying SSOs I think I've ever made when it, uh, when it comes to getting into LKO. I think if you've never managed to get into low carbon orbit with an SSO before, I would be pretty confident in saying that you could do it with this one. I'm very happy with how this turned out. Again, ludicrously over-engineered and overbuilt for what it really needs to do. And it does have a bit of part clipping with the nuclear engine. I know I said the RTGs are clipped and it's kind of okay, but there is definitely a fuel tank clipped into that rear um, adapter piece that's probably pushing it a little bit too far, but that's mainly for the aesthetics rather than the actual performance gains with a Z. So I don't think it's too much of a problem. Here we are watching our apoapsis intersect our uh, space station's orbit and let's see how close we got to an encounter. There it is. So our target is slightly behind us. We're going to keep on burning a little bit so our apoapsis is above our target's height. Uh, so we're in a slower orbit and as you can see, once we, uh, once we pass our apoapsis and get to our second encounter, we're getting much, much closer. Only a kilometre away, which is good enough for me. We'll just execute that burn and... Uh, you know, do some adjustments after that. So I set up that maneuver node there just to put ourselves into a roughly similar orbit to our space station, just so I could gauge how long it would take to uh, reduce our tar our relative velocity to our target to zero, which in this case was about two minutes. So I knew to start burning about a minute before our closest approach, and we'd get an optimal encounter situation. So now that we're fairly close, we're in eyeball distance of the space station. There it is, Jevon Bal admiring the structure in the distance we can just burn towards our target at about you know it's between five and seven meters per second I think i've got six and a half meters per second there oh actually what i'm doing here is uh boosting up the ambient light just to try and get our visuals looking as bright as possible now that we're on the dark side of the planet and here we are looming into view so just before we get close we're gonna kill off all our target velocity here and then we're going to choose a docking port to uh, dock to, so to speak. So I went with this one here for no particular reason other than the fact that it's nice and clear from uh, any kind of sticky outy bits of the space station, I guess, aside from the solar panels. Speaking of sticky outy bits of the space station, I know I did say that I have those arms coming off the edge, the, uh, the laboratory and habitation modules, I should say completely unnecessary from a functional standpoint they're only there from an aesthetic purpose although i guess i did say at the very beginning that space stations are 99 percent for the aesthetics anyway so uh, but yeah they didn't really need to unfold to provide any additional function but i guess it does mean that the solar panels are a little bit more clear and it does open up the the open up some space for uh extension more so than if they were just left flush against the surface of that uh, no, I guess it's become a sort of docking arm almost, hasn't it? So I did have to be careful with the uh, SSTO's wing not clipping into the solar panels. I've got Jebediah on EVA to provide some lighting for us, which didn't work out too well, but at least he could open up the solar panel. Open up the solar panel? Open up the shielded docking port, because obviously no one is aboard the space station right now, so we needed a Kerbal to get out and manually open that clamp. Although I am pretty sure there is a probe core on board this thing, so... Another moot point, but it's uh, it looked cool. Okay, guys, that was the main motivational factor. And there we are. You may have noticed as well that Jeb is wearing his brand new spanking spacesuit that he got from the DLC. So I've actually uh, color-coded our Kerbals here because, of course, we now have, provided you have all the DLC, we now have three spacesuits for the Kerbals. We have the original spacesuit, we have the Making History spacesuit, and we have the Breaking Ground spacesuit. I guess there's also the... Uh, the orange spacesuit for the original four Kerbals as well, but we can just ignore that. And that, of course, means that we can color code Kerbals because there are three kinds of Kerbals. We have pilots, we have uh, engineers, and we have tour 
we have tourists, we have tourists. So there's actually four kinds of covers. <laughs> but ignoring tourists, we have pilots, we have engineers, and we have scientists. So for general normal missions, that means that you can put your scientists in one suit, engineers in another suit, and pilots in another suit so you can see really, really quickly what their roles are without having to tab through and look at their EVA portraits or anything like that. And I guess it's nice that they all get their own uniform for their role, like on, I don't know, Star Trek, kind of. So that's one of the things you may notice uh, in this video, but you probably wouldn't, only a few of you might notice it unless I specifically pointed it out. So that's the thing that I might start doing in future videos actually, is the colour coding Kerbal's uh, uniforms. So we're going to do a quick tour of the space station with Jebediah here. Those four Mark 1 passenger bays all in that big cluster are meant to serve as the habitation modules because we've got four Kerbals aboard. They all get their own little tube to live in. We've got the rotating dishes here just so that they're always in constant connection with something and they're always uh, changing their orientation. Pretty pointless, uh, pretty unrealistic, but it looks very, very cool. I hope you'll agree. And so that was the main reason. Did I say Jebediah was doing the tour? I meant to say Valentina was doing the tour. I forgot I forgot that I'd actually put Jebediah back on board and switched our cobbles around. In fact, was was it always Valentina on EVA? I can't be bothered to go and check. Uh, I, I'm just going to continue and hope that it was... Uh, hope that it worked out okay. But even if it didn't, I've now clarified it. So either way, it doesn't matter too much. So we've got a nice uh, flyby, slow flyby shot of the space station docked with the SSTO. And that is the core phase of the missions <laughs> complete. But now, of course, we need to get our SSTO back. So Jebediah and Val aren't here to stay. They're going to go back home and uh, spread the good word of the brand new space station in low carbon orbit. In fact, uh, the space station in low carbon orbit, because as you can see, we don't have any of our normal infrastructure in orbit here. And that's because I've started a new save specifically to showcase the new breaking ground stuff, because old saves, to my knowledge at least, what I was told, old saves don't have all the new stuff like surface features and randomly generated things unless you update the save file manually and then the, those things will get added retroactively but these things, apparently that can sometimes cause bugs and glitches here and there so it's probably better, at least from my point of view, where I want, I was going to say, where I want my saves to be flawless, even though this commentary has definitely been far from flawless and as indeed the rest of this flight, what with me crushing the lower stage unintentionally and all that um, but I thought, you know, just try and keep things as clean as possible. I should probably start a new save file just for showing off the uh, breaking ground stuff, which brings me to uh, a new series I'm thinking about doing, Laon Aerospace 2. Title is a work in progress there. I thought it would be nice to do another... Oh, Scatterer suddenly glitched out there in the atmosphere. Dis don't you hate it, guys, when the atmosphere just disappears? But it came back, don't worry. And uh, it, Well, I say atmosphere, it's the clouds, isn't it? The clouds disappeared for a few seconds, then came back, so it was fine. We can just polish over that. Like I was saying, it would be nice to do another Laon Aerospace Series 2 where we unlock the tech tree all over again. Right now I've just cheated the tech tree to be unlocked, which is fine for videos like this because I just want to showcase specific things. But for a playthrough it would be nice and, you know, for my own peace of mind when it's my own personal save file, I like knowing that I um, I unlocked all the parts properly, uh, quote-unquote. So it would be nice to do a playthrough. I've been toying either career mode or science mode, but honestly I think career mode just isn't very well suited two playthroughs in Kerbal Space Program because there's a lot of grindy missions, what with a lot of missions and contracts consisting of testing parts at specific altitudes, and there's a lot of faffing around doing things like tourists to LKO and back again, whereas the things I want to do in my videos are a little bit more ambitious than that. So I don't think career mode lends itself too well to a playthrough, so I think I'll do another science playthrough. I did try uh, ultra-hard career mode and... Dear goodness gracious me, it was the most grindy thing. I think that would be, it's, not, it's too boring for a video series. So as a compromise for those that want a career playthrough, I'm thinking about doing the science playthrough as the core. But as a secondary series, I'm thinking about doing live as like a live stream series of doing a career mode. So maybe I'll do that, like a live stream career mode. I don't know what days I'd do this, maybe on Thursday. I haven't thought this far ahead, and I don't know how much time I'll have to regularly do big, long live streams, but it's an idea I've had, at least. So I've got that going for me. So that could be a compromise. We do a normal playthrough uh, series with science mode and do like a career mode series uh, live. And that is the SSTO landed. I deployed the uh, antennas. So you could see them, even though I forgot to deploy them on the actual mission itself. Oops. Here's a final little shot of our brave Kerbals 
aboard the space station and here are some videos on screen last week's was of course the first video i did of breaking ground which is a juno mission where we deploy all the surface science the one on the right is just chosen for you by youtube's algorithm don't forget to check out audible in the description and all the other stuff uh, and i hope you have a great day guys